intertrochanteric femur fractures. This is from the OTA resident core curriculum lecture series version five. The slides are by Dr. Michael Blankstein and I'm Sake Brahma narrating. And this is the third and last video in this slide deck. We already talked about classification, co-management, timing of surgery. Uh, we talked a lot about um, appropriate uh, fixation techniques, uh, sliding hip screw versus cephalomedullary nails. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about alternative fixation devices and then a little bit about uh, um, outcomes. So um, what are some disadvantages of, of a lag screw? Um, whether you know, you're using a lag screw through a nail or a sliding hip screw plate device. Well, there's potential femoral head rotation while you're inserting it. Uh, maybe after fixation, you don't have the best rotational control. Um, you have to basically take out bone, uh, you know, a lot of times with a large drill prior to screw placement, uh, and then um, potential loss of fixation with uh, osteoporotic bone. So can you get even better fixation? And here you can see there's some other implant designs uh, and fixation techniques. On the left, you can see here's a sliding hip screw device with two screws. Uh, to provide better rotational control. Here's a device that uses a um, helical blade to try and remove less bone with the fixation technique. And here's a, here's a device where you actually are injecting cement through fenestrations in the screw itself um, to occupy some of that um, uh, bone void with your fixation. So, What's the rationale behind the helical blade? Well, it's thought to have better anchorage by compaction of the trabecular bone during the blade insertion, uh, and that helps with rotational control. It doesn't require overdrilling, so that effectively retains cancellous bone. And there's some biomechanical studies suggesting helical blades may have higher cutout resistance. So here's a pro prospective randomized uh, trial uh, from 2011 comparing the screw versus helical blade. Nope. No difference in cutout rates. They both import, uh, performed well. And again, it all comes back to tip apex distance and minimizing that in, uh, to help avoid cutout. So what about uh, meta-analysis of randomized control trials, uh, outcomes related to cutout, complications? They were, they were similar. Another study, is there a difference in cutout between these uh, devices? This is a retrospective review, 362 patients. Um, slightly higher cutouts with helical blades, actually, compared to lag screws, and that was statistically significant. Um, and uh, the patients who did have cutout had, um, um, you know, the average tip apex distance was significant, uh, significantly greater um, for patients who had uh, cut out for blades and screws. So um, again, tip apex distance, you want that less than 25. Uh, another thing you can see with the helical blade is something shown here on the right, which is a cut in or a cut through. So what can happen rarely is uh, something you don't see quite as much with the lag screw is that as the as the fragment shortens, right? So the frag, the, you know, the head fragment was probably originally here, but as it shortens, the blade itself, which is designed to cut its way into the bone, um, can cut its way through the subchondral bone and into the joint, uh, and that can happen if this, if you know, the the, the screw here is just not sliding properly. Um, is probably what's going on. So this is somewhat a unique mode of failure. You don't see with the lag screw. Here you can see it again, uh, the sort of cut in or medial cut out. So it's not because the tip apex distance was bad. Um, they're just, you just didn't have appropriate sliding of the fragment and the kind of blade stays a little bit in a fixed position and the head slides relative to the blade um, as is shown here. So what about cement augmentation? So there's here's a uh, proprietary device shown here uh, in which you have fenestrations in the lag screw. So after the screw goes in, you sort of inject this cement up into here and then, and then it's delivered 
out through fenestrations in the screw, and that can sort of occupy some of the bone void there and um, essentially improve your fixation potentially. So uh, not really a, lot, a whole lot of uh, uh, data on this. Um, here is a um, one particular study in which they did use uh, the augmented nail and uh, showed that it you know certainly can be safe to use. Um, another uh, randomized control trial from 2018 uh, showing that um, you know there was no reoperation um, and maybe this has potential to prevent reoperations by doing this. Uh, didn't necessarily improve their functional outcomes. What about a device that uses two screws? So this is sort of a linear controlled uh, compression, right? But improve rotational stability. So these two screws uh, are somewhat linked uh, or integrated. Um, so they still provide um, you know, fixation, but also uh, axial compression, but less rotation. So are two screws better than one? Here's a, uh, a sort of evaluation of uh, that compared with a single screw device. And it seemed that um, the single screw device, which is the traditional intramedullary cephalomedullary nail, had a significantly higher failure rate, 7.7% um, compared to 1.7%. And um, p-value was less than 0. It was, I'm sorry, 0. 0.007. So statistically significant. Um, uh, another study, uh, uh, five-year outcome analysis looking at um, prospective randomized trial, two screws versus a single screw, and um, the uh, cutout rates were similar, uh, but at five years, no significant differences. So let's talk a little bit about post-op management. Weight bearing accelerated is the main goal. Um, so these are, if you have an elderly patient with an inner trochanteric femur fracture, you wanna get them out of bed, you wanna get them weight bearing. Um, so that is one of the reasons you do the surgery. Um, DVT prophylaxis is critical. Um, I would advise you to, uh, again, go back, look at the aaos.org clinical practice guidelines uh, to get some guidance on this. Um, so in conclusion, you know, fixing the hip as soon as possible uh, is the best thing for the patient in general. A multidisciplinary approach is key. Um, Co-management can really be helpful with a standardized perioperative pathway. Uh, many hospitals have enough of these patients in which you can do this. Um, get the surgery right the first time. Pay attention to tip apex distance. Use the right implant. Focus on return to function and activities of daily living. Uh, and one thing we didn't talk about a lot is that um, these patients often by definition have osteoporosis and may need to be appropriately treated medically um, in order to help prevent future fractures. And I mentioned before, um, you can look up some of the recent clinical practice guidelines, which are very thoroughly researched to try and follow those. Cutout after cephalomedullary nail uh, or sliding hip screw is really a technique issue. So it's important to get a good quality reduction, but it's also important to make sure that the implant is properly placed and you minimize the tip apex distance. Uh, sliding hip screws work well for simple intertrochanteric femur fractures. Uh, if you're using a cephalomedullary nail, we talked about how using distal locking screws might help decrease the risk of fracture uh, at the end of the rod. Um, so a lot of times people will put the rod in, no distal locking screws. Again, there's a little bit of data suggesting maybe that's not a great idea. Uh, as long as you don't have substantial subtrochanteric extension, you can often use short nails. <clears throat> Basic cervical fractures, probably best treated with a sliding hip screw, although we don't have tons of data uh, on this one. Again, tip apex distance should be less than 25 millimeters. So typically the deep center center position. One mistake I see made is that people feel like they're center center, but they're in the center of the femoral head. That's not where you wanna be. You need to be deep and center center, meaning close to the, you have to be all the way up to the subchondral bone, not in the center of, not in the sort of center of the sphere 
of the femoral head. You need to be all the way in, but then not too proxim not too superior, not too inferior, not too anterior or posterior. So deep and center center. Um, if you're using uh, a nail, you may want to be slightly inferior um, with your lag screw. And we talked about um, alternative devices such as dual integrated screws, helical blades. Um, although we still haven't completely eliminated cutout. The blade also has this sort of cut through or medial cutout or cut in phenomenon. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful about that. And uh, we're still learning a little bit more about uh, cement augmentation as a um, as another alternative. So um, you may want to head over to OTA or otaonline.org. And if you're a member, you can take a look at this technique video. The videos are really high quality at OTA.org. Um, so uh, go over to otaonline.org. And if you're a member, you can uh, access some really, really good videos. Here's another one on the long cephalomedullary nail that I encourage you to check out. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll end this uh, lecture. Uh, thanks for your attention.